morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome Central. Are you glad you're here? I am glad you're here. Thanks for being here. And also, uh, which in, in any of the campuses, wherever you are, we're uh, thinking of you. If you're online, we're thinking of you. We are not able to all be in one place, but we are able to be of one spirit. And I just want you to know that we're thinking about you. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, we're going to continue in our study of James today. We'll finish this next week. Uh, but I need you to open your Bible to James chapter 5. And uh, if you'll just take a moment to find that. The passage we're going to talk about today, I think, is really, really important. It's very, very applicable. And uh, I think it's one of these you're going to want to pay attention to because I think if you listen to it, uh, it can change the way you live your life. It's that important. Okay, so uh, while you're finding James chapter 5, I want to take you on a tour. Uh, I want to take you somewhere. I don't know if you have ever had the privilege of going over to Europe and experiencing any of the cathedrals of Europe. If you have, you know uh, that it's, it's a breathtaking experience, okay? If you haven't, put this thing on your bucket list. Uh, it doesn't have to be any particular cathedral. They're, they're just... They're, uh, they're, uh, there was a different time that people saw God differently than we see God. And, and God was so much more the center of their lives. And, and these buildings were meant to be an expression of the grandeur of God. And it's, again, they're just breathtaking. So um, in Cologne, Germany is a particular cathedral. It's considered one of the finest of all the cathedrals in the world. Uh, it is known as the Cologne Cathedral. And I'll show you a couple of pictures so you can get an image in your mind. Uh, the bre breathtaking, just absolutely breathtaking. And again, you'll see pictures of it as I'm talking. Uh, it's not the building itself that uh, I want to draw your attention to. It's the story behind the building that I think is absolutely and utterly remarkable. You see, they started to build this cathedral in the year 1248. Uh, it was built as a place for the Holy Roman emperors to worship God, all right? It was begun by a guy named Frederick II, and he knew when it began that uh, there would be no way he would see it finished in his lifetime. So stop right there and just think, what are you doing right now that's going to live beyond you? So he began this, uh, this project, and um, they built on this cathedral, okay, all the way, and let me get the exact year so I don't get it wrong, it started in 1248, and they built on it until 1473, 225 years. And in the year of 14, they took a break and they stopped for a little while and then they got back on it. They finished this cathedral to its original plan, started in 1248, they finished it in 1880. 632 years to complete. Isn't that incredible? 632 years. I want to suggest that in our day and age, none of us would ever think of beginning anything that would take that long to complete, yes? I mean, you just don't, we don't think like that. If, if I told you, hey, we're going to build a, a, a campus, uh, it's going to take 10 years to complete, we would all go, 10 years? You'll be kidding. Ten, that's ridiculous. If I told you it took five years. Hey, and particularly where I am right here on this campus and other campuses, you might not relate to this. How many of us were irritated beyond measure that it took so long to get that road finally finished <laughs> in, in front of our campus, right? It was like two years. How long, town of Gilbert, is it going to take? You see, the reason I'm taking you on this tour is because I want to set up what we're going to talk about in James because we, we, are, uh, we are not patient people. We, uh, the, the patience is not a modern day virtue whatsoever. Impatience is the modern day virtue. Uh, I want it and I want it now and I want it the way I want it. And it, it's just kind of a, a, a different world that we live in than that would build a building that takes that long. We, we want everything fast. Okay, let's just be honest. We, we're like, we don't want to date. We want to speed date. Let's just get, you know, I'll, I'll know within like three minutes, okay? Let's just figure this out real fast. We don't, we don't want food. We want fast food. Like, how long is it? I don't have time. We want fast food. We, we just think this way. Uh, when we order from Amazon, you, what do you mean it's not same-day delivery? <laughs> this is ridiculous. How long do I have to wait? This is crazy. We honk at people at green lights. Like, come on already. The light turned green. Let's go. 
Not only that, be honest, church, God is watching. When you pull up to an intersection, do you not evaluate the cars and the stack of traffic? To side, you do the exact same thing at the grocery store. And you feel like such a loser when you pick the wrong line. That guy got an after me over there, why? Everything about us, man, we cut corners. We want shortcuts. We abbreviate our texts, LOL. We, I don't have time to say all that. We, are, we want everything so fast. That's why debt exists in our culture. I don't, I don't have time to wait to save up. I need it and I, I need it right now. It's just the nature of the age in which we live. There's a book called Social Acceleration and it's written by a guy named Hartmut Rosa. And he gives these numbers. He says the speed of human involvement from, uh, human movement, excuse me, from pre-modern times to now, pre-modern to now, has increased 100 times. We are moving 100 times faster. Uh, at the speed of communication, he says, has skyrocketed by a factor of 10 million. The speed of data transmission, somewhere around 10 billion. We're, we're speeding up so much that they've even documented from the 1990s to now, we walk 10% faster than we used to walk. Everything is like quick, quick come on, get going. And I know this is, this is hard to understand. For, for, those of, for those of us who have been on the planet for a while, uh, and, and to young people over here, let me just comment, all right, wherever you are. Um, I, I know this is really a mind-blowing thing, but we used to have phones. S stay with me. You'd have to put your finger in, in a dial and, and there were all these holes. There was like 10 holes and they were numbered. And you'd get the number and you'd have to dial. You put your finger in there and you would have to turn the dial. If it was started with a seven, you'd have to go. And then there was a little stop right there. And then you pull your finger out and then you dial the next number, nine. It's called a rotary phone. I know it's bizarre. And, and you hated it when it had a bunch of zeros in it. This is gonna take forever. Uh, I, I know this is also hard to believe, but um, in days gone by, days of old, days of yore, we had, the, we, they called them party lines. Anybody here remember party lines? Yeah, I see some hands. Party lines, I know this is hard to believe, but you'd pick up your rotary dial phone and you put it to your ear and you'd hear somebody talking. Because see, you didn't have a dedicated, it wasn't your line, it was a group's line. It was your neighborhood's line. And, and your neighbors could be on there. So you only have like a couple of choices. You can pick it up and you can hear voices on there. Somebody's using the line. So you can do one of two things. You can hang up or you could eavesdrop. Those were your choices. And, but you knew you're not gonna use the line because you can't get a dial tone because somebody's on it. It's just the way it was. When, when you didn't know like where somebody was, you, you didn't carry a, like a contact in your phone. You, you'd have, I know this is gonna be hard to believe. You had these things, we called them phone books. Phone books, phone books? what do you mean a phone book? Yeah, yeah, and guess what? They came in multiple colors. There was white and there was a yellow. The yellow pages had the businesses and the white, the white had people. And, and, and I know this is really bizarre because like when do you ever need this anymore? but you'd actually have to know the alphabet <laughs> because you'd look up and it was alphabetized and you'd have to go, well, where's Q coming in? And you, if you didn't know where Q was, you'd have no idea even where to begin. And, 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 and the, when you found the number, you, you wouldn't just press a button, call so-and-so, no, no, no. You'd have to write it down on your hand. So you'd have the phone book there and you'd be writing the number. You have to keep your eyes on that because there's a whole list. Of, and, this is the original Palm Pilot, by the way. Um, <laughs> communicate, so, then they came up with this thing, like, remember when you were a kid and you had a walkie-talkie, anyone? Remember walkie? They came up with this thing called CBs, citizen band radios. You could reach somebody like three miles away. You could literally, hey, hey, breaker, breaker, good buddy. Got your ears on, remember any of this? Yeah, I would come back at you, man. And you could talk to somebody and it would it'd be in your car. You could travel and talk to people. I'm telling you all this just to say the obvious. You know, today we carry our phones and your phone's is, it's a computer. I mean, it's got all kinds of stuff on it. You don't have to think about much of anything. It's all right there. 
When you didn't know something, you wouldn't just hit your phone and hit Google. You'd have to, I know this is bizarre. You have to go to a place called a library. Yeah, you have to do your research at the library. And if you were in a debate or somebody, you go, let's, get, let's find out. Let's get back here next week. We'll go to the library and we'll research it. Everything. Uh, you know, we used to bake in the oven. I put food in the oven and it took some time. Now we just microwave it. And then we look at a microwave and go, a microwave is so stinking slow. Like how many times, if you, have, if you work at a business, they have a kitchen, how many times do you go in there and you're going to put your thing in the microwave and it's got like eight seconds left on the timer? The person before you, I'm not waiting eight seconds, man. I'm done. Pull it out. It's warm enough. It's cooked enough. It's just... Uh, uh, the, way it, the way of our world right now is everything is going so, so fast. Well, well I, I, I don't think you could see this in the same way. I think it's really hard to understand and appreciate. Like, we can travel now, and I know we know this. We know this, all right? It, we get it. You can literally, uh, they, they say, I, I, I don't know. They say that anywhere on the planet can be accessed in 48 hours. I, I don't know about the polls, I don't know about that. 48 hours is all anywhere. Can you imagine Magellan starting out on a voyage out of you know, Portugal or Spain, wherever he launched from, going, we'll be there and back in two days, wherever there is. These guys would get in these ships and they would just head out on the horizon. Years later, be, come back. Everything is so fast. Everything is so fast. Um, I was looking at some book titles. This, I think, just says it all. I got a long list. I'll just read a couple. 12 Months to a Million Dollars. These are real titles, by the way. 30 Ways to, in 30 Days to a Better Life. Um, seven Days to a Brand New Me. Seven Days to Sexy. I read that one. It was actually pretty good. <laughs> Don't we need any of those? That's the mentality in which we live. Okay, now you go, why are we talking about all this? Okay, so last week, we talked about the fact that James in chapter five was talking about that our perspectives and our priorities will set the direction of our life. And you've got to think about your perspectives and your priorities because wherever those are, that's where you're going. That's your future. And today what I want to talk about, I'm going to drop the big idea right here. It's not profound, it's just very true and something we don't think a lot about. Impatience destroys our trust in God. Impatience destroys our trust in God. And we live in an extremely impatient age and that's the connection we're gonna make. The faster you go, the farther you're gonna move away from God. And we live in a very fast paced society. Now, let's go to James and the first two words that he's gonna say in James chapter five, we're gonna begin with verse uh, seven. First two words, be patient. And already go, Pfft. who's got time for patience? He starts this whole thing, he's gonna tell us, be patient, you gotta be patient, all right? Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield this valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers or sisters or you will be judged, and the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. Now you've, heard, you've all heard about Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else, and all you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Now that last verse might not seem like it fits with the other verse, but I'll show you exactly how it does fit. There's two kinds of impatience James is talking about here, two kinds. There is impatience with God and there is impatience with people. Impatience with God and impatience with people. Either one of those will destroy your trust in God. But let me, let me just do what he did. Let me, he illustrates this point with a couple of simple illustrations. He says, take a farmer, a farmer understands that you don't drop a seed in the ground and have a vegetable tomorrow. That there's a process that that seed has to go through. This is take a farmer. A farmer understands if you don't have patience, you don't have crops. 
you put it in the ground, and here's what, here's the point, here's the point. Something's happening, but not to your eyes. And, and if you've ever grown anything in your backyard garden, you know that watching things grow is like watching paint dry. It's just like nothing much is happening. But a ton of stuff is happening. You just can't see it. You can't understand. So he says, hey, think about a farmer. That's, that'd be good. And, and, and then, by the way, he says, who, you, autumn and spring rains. Who relies on the autumn and the spring rains. You understand autumn and spring are seasons? Not that one week or that one day. These are seasons that it takes to grow crops. So be patient, he says, like a farmer. And then he says, I like the prophets of old. This is what we just read. I like the prophets of old. I don't know for sure who he had in mind when he said the prophets of old. He could have been speaking about Jeremiah. There's so many prophets in the Old Testament. He doesn't name who he's talking about. He's going to mention Job. I'll get to Job in just a minute. But he says prophets of old, like Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached and preached and preached. He did everything he knew how to do to communicate to the people of Israel and Judah Jerusalem, like this is what's happening here. And they just absolutely blew him off. They, they, they literally abused him and they threw him in a cistern, a well in the ground, literally to die. And uh, he wrote a book. Uh, we have the book of Jeremiah, but we also have the book of Lamentations. The, it's a book of the laments of this prophet. He's known as the weeping prophet because he would tell people and talk to them and talk to them and they wouldn't do anything different. And eventually he had to watch Jerusalem get sacked and just to get destroyed. And he just cried. He just, or Isaiah, we can talk about Isaiah. Isaiah preached and preached and preached and 66 chapters in your Bible about this guy just telling, this is what God is saying. Blew him off. In fact, they, they killed him. Tradition says he was sawn in two, literally sawn in two. Like we don't wanna hear any more of what you have to say. And then he mentions Job. You probably know there's a whole book in your Bible by the name of Job. It's not a short book. It's a very old book, but it's a fascinating book. It's, it's about this, this guy and he, I mean, he suffered great physical and emotional pain. Um, if you just read the first couple of chapters and really it's the second chapter, you get the, the book of this. You realize that he was very, very wealthy, but he had to watch every good thing he had in his life go up in smoke, okay? For instance, in in the second chapter, he, you find out he had oxen and donkeys, and those were stolen from him. He had sheep and he had servants, and those were destroyed by fire. He had sons and daughters, all of whom died in the same tragic accident. He had, uh, he had Satan kind of hounding him, and Satan afflicted him with sores, boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And, and, there, and there he's left, and it's like, but he's mentioning him, like the perseverance of Job. Job, what are you gonna do? Well, he didn't just quit, he didn't just give up. And in fact, it's interesting because in the book of Job, he has comforters who come alongside. He has his wife, for instance. His wife, nothing happened to her, except we get to read what she said to him, Job 2, 9. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die already. That's a fine woman. <laughs> I wonder if Job in the midst of all of this is just going, you took my kids, you took my sheep, you took my donkeys, but you left her. I just, I don't know. I can't imagine my wife saying, just curse God and die. Then he had these friends that came around him. They were his comforters. And, and, and they eventually, they started off all right. And then pretty soon they're like, going, Job, you did this to yourself. This is your fault. So Job finally says this in Job 16 too, I have heard many things like these. You are miserable comforters, all of you. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? Get off of me, is what he's saying. Just leave me alone. And what's remarkable about Job and Isaiah and Jeremiah and, in fact, in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, there's a whole list of guys, men and women. It's called the Hall of Fame of Faith, is what's been dubbed. It's just this hero and this hero and this hero. But you know what you get after you get all the heroes? You get this little paragraph that I think is profound. It, Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 13, says, all these people, all these heroes, were still living by faith when they died. They, they did not receive the things promised, 
They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Now, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Here's the point. They're living on the same planet you and I are living on, and all these things are happening to them, and they never gave up. Because it wasn't this that was so important to them. It was heaven. It was the future. And by the way, this is a very crucial thing to remember right now on the cusp of the election. I don't know how things are going to turn out. I don't know. But you know what? Ultimately, I don't care because this is not all there is to life. But if this is all there is to life to you, you'll, you will care. You will care because you're not looking forward to a better country. You're looking forward to a heavenly dwelling. Perspective. Perspective. All right? So anyway, the point is good things come to those who wait. St. Augustine said the reward of patience is patience. That's the reward. And, and if you've ever heard the prayer, God, I want patience and I want it now. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But let's go back to those two kinds of impatience. Keep moving, all right? There's impatience with God, and he uses the illustration of the second coming. You gotta understand that when, when Jesus left, he said, I'm gonna be back. They were going like by dinner? Like when, to, this week? Tomorrow, they had no concept that 2,000 years later, we would be here and we're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, who I believe with all my heart is coming. My watch wants to know if I have fallen. <laughs> um, get a little passionate about this. Um, and, and, but, the, but, you know, the, the Lord's coming, he's returning. And they're going, but he didn't come. He didn't come yesterday. He didn't come the day before. And, and James is trying to say, people, some patience here. Wait, just wait. It's so easy for us to fall into this. Peter comes along and starts figuring this thing out. Uh, this is not gonna happen as quick as we were all anticipating. So it says this in 2 Peter 3, 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, a promise as some understand slowness, He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. God's timing is different. So, hey, it's only been two days to God. I said, I'd come back right away. It's only been two days. A thousand years is as a day. Relax, I'm coming. And uh, don't get so, don't get in such a hurry. Why aren't you back? God, why have you not come? Because you have friends, I'm, just, I'm talking to you right now, you have friends, you've not yet told them about Jesus. And if he comes back right now, they're gonna go to hell. God goes, I'll oh, wait, I'll give you time. Talk to your friends about eternity, about time and what really matters. I'll wait for you. It's all perspective, all right? It's, Paul said it this way, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. How does a thief in the night come? Does he announce? No, a thief in the night comes when you don't expect a thief in the night to come. Because if you expected a thief in the night to come, you'd be sitting up on your couch with a shotgun fully loaded, pointed at the door. And by the way, let me just chase a rabbit here for a minute. I, 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 I am so internally bothered by the way I've watched preachers manipulate people in a time like this playing on our worst fears. You know, this is the end. Jesus Christ, come back. You better be ready. And he might be coming back right away. I don't know. But, but preachers are using fear in people to motivate them to get in line right now. Here, here's the deal. Jesus was asked in what's called the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, when are you coming back? And you know what he said? That, I, I, that's not for me to know. That's for my father to set. When Jesus was asked, when are you coming back? He said, I, I don't know, but it will be like a thief in the night. In, in other words, when you don't expect it, that's when I'm coming. And here's my problem. If Jesus himself doesn't know when he's coming back, what preacher out there can declare he's coming back this year? He'll, he'll be back right now. Anyone who tells me they know, 
I know you don't know. Because if Jesus didn't know, you don't know, and I trust him, not you. End of issue. It could be the end. I don't know. I, Jesus said he didn't know. I don't know. But don't get manipulated by your fear uh, to uh, you know, somebody else's agenda. Right? So impatient with the second coming, impatient with prayer. And we'll talk more about this in just a minute. But impatient with prayer. It's like, God, come on already. Answer this prayer. Why, aren't, why don't you care? Why don't you do this? Maybe God's doing stuff you don't see. So impatience with God. And then he's talking about impatience with people. Impatience with people. Uh, I don't know if you heard this, but in James 5, 9, he says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or, or you will be judged. And the judge is standing at the door. Grumble. That's, that's a fascinating word. It's kind of like the word mutter. Grumble and mutter. When you say the word, you do the thing, right? When you mutter. You're muttering. When you grumble, you grumble. It's just, it comes out that way. Grumbling is whining. It's complaining. It's airing your grievances. Grumbling is very, very common. And I mean, we, we grumble certainly when we're impatient, but we grumble when we're let down, when we're disappointed, when we feel like we're wrong, when we feel like we're mistreated. There's an incredible example of grumbling. I'll just take a moment. In the Old Testament, the Israelites in Egypt were made slaves. They were made slaves for hundreds of years. And they would cry out to God. Literally, they would whine to God. They would grumble to God. Set us free. Why are we down here? Why can't we? You know, they're so close to Israel, but they're not there. They're in captivity in, in Egypt. And they're crying out to God. Oh, if you loved us, you... And God... When he was ready, he sent a deliverer. That's Moses, a savior, a rescuer. He's going to set the people free. And he goes down there and he sets them free. And they're so glad to be out of Egypt and out of bondage. And he takes them out in what's called the Sinai, uh, the Sinai Desert and on, their way to, on their way to Israel, okay? But out there, all they could do is whine and whine and whine and complain and complain and complain. What should have taken like 13 days took 40 years because God just kept sending them in circles. I mean, literally. But you know what happened out there? Why? Let, 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 in fact, let me just, let me read to you. Uh, this comes from Exodus chapter 16, all right? And, and by the way, when I do this, I kind of have to put tone to it or you're not really gonna understand what's happening. So the Israelites said to them, Moses and Aaron, if only we had died, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, man. There, we, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, man. It was awesome. But you have brought us out here into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. We're miserable, Moses. Yeah, you're welcome. That was free. If I was Moses, no, we can't go there. <laughs> God, just give us the good old days back. Give us the good old days in Egypt. Wow. And by the way, God doesn't like grumblers. In Numbers 14, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, not the people, the Lord, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. Be careful when you grumble, folks. It turns God off. It certainly turns people off. And by the way, so they would grumble. James is saying, guys, don't grumble against one another. It's not of God. Quit, quit your grumbling. He also then says this thing, it seems like it doesn't fit. Um, you know, James 5.12, above all my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not, not by heaven or by earth or anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you'll be condemned. He's not saying don't say cuss words. That's not what he's saying. It had gotten so bad that People wouldn't take people at their word, kind of like where we live today. In other words, hey, you swear, put your hand on a Bible, sign this contract, fill this out. I don't believe the best of you. Jesus goes, look, live in such a way that you're a person of character and integrity. If you say you'll do it, you'll do it. If you say you won't, you won't. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And he, James took that from Jesus, by the way. So God, what do you want from us? What do you want from us? Here's what God wants from you and me. He wants us to persevere. He wants us to have some stick to some grit. And folks, it's not in our culture. 
we just, anything gets hard, we quit. We walk away. And, and literally, uh, we got to learn how to look at Jesus. In fact, I, got, I just got to take you one, one passage into Hebrews chapter 12. He, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about perspective and priorities. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us know us everything, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. But when we run, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on him, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not the problem, not the issue, not the frustration, not the person, on Jesus. All right, now let me close. So, you know what scripture teaches us? And I don't know if you've thought about this. Impatience destroys our trust in God. Impatience just destroys it. And you gotta make a decision at some point. What do you want? Do you want to serve God or do you want to serve some form of time? Impatience destroys your trust in God. I don't know if you understand this. Now listen carefully. This can sum up a bunch. Our culture is sped up and it's so impatient. God didn't go with it. The culture has changed. God hasn't changed. God is God. And, and I just need you to understand God's not in a hurry God is never running around in a panic. You'll never see Jesus running anywhere. You'll never see Jesus in a hurry in the Bible. He's in a hurry, never. And in fact, he was condemned at times by his friends. Can you just speed it up? Because he's got a different way to look at time. John Mark Comer said this, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. Hmm. Have, have we lost the ability to wait? If God said, I have something really good for you, but you're gonna to have to wait, could you wait? Could you delay the gratification and just, just wait, trust God, wait? In my own quiet time, I'm reading through Psalms and this is all over Psalms. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 33, 20, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 37, 7, be still in the Lord and wait patiently for him. You see, this is all through the Bible. God is not in a hurry. We're in a hurry. I want to close. I want to show you a TikTok. And yes, I look at TikToks. I watch TikToks. We're going to cross this TikTok and I thought, oh my gosh. Um, I won't even say anything. I'll show you this and I'll say a few words afterwards. Just a TikTok. So I was on an airplane with my son and my daughter and my husband at the time, and I was so stressed because he was young, he was like 10 months old, and I was nursing, and it was our first flying experience as a family with two children under the age of two. And I remember getting on that plane and just praying because I hate flying, which is crazy because I was in the Air Force, but that's another story. <coughs> um, and I was praying, God, please, please be with me up on this flight. Please don't let the kids scream and, and bother everybody around us because I'm so stressed out right now. And sure enough, as soon as we began to fly, my son was just not having it. He was crying. There was nothing I could do to comfort him. I was clearly stressed out. And the woman in front of me, I felt so bad for because like he was right in her ear and I thought, she turns around, she's probably gonna cuss me out. <laughs> but that's not what happened. She turned around, she looked at me, she goes, can I try? And I thought, well, if she's crazy, she can't get off the plane with my son. And I looked at her and I said, sure, you go ahead and try. She goes, well, if you don't mind, I'd like to hold him and just walk around the aisle with him. And I was so desperate. I was like, do whatever you have to do. She could tell I was struggling. And I was so disappointed with God because I was like, look, I prayed for this. I prayed for you to take care of this on this airplane. And this is crazy. And so she, she stood up, I put my son in her arms, and he's crying, and he didn't want her at all. And she began to walk down the aisle. Everybody's staring at us because, I mean, what else do you do on an airplane when you're the loudest family on there? 
And as she began to walk, I just kind of leaned over and watched her in the hallway with my, my son. And sure enough, he stops crying. And sure enough, before I knew it, this woman sitting where the flight attendant would sit. And he was just passed out. She held him for the entire flight. In fact, he, he had a sweat mark on her arm. His hair was drenched with sweat. And she just, she didn't give him back, she, which was awesome because I needed a break for all you moms out there who have flown with children that just cried the entire flight. I hear you. And so we land and I couldn't thank her enough. And, and, and I was like, thank you God for answering my prayers. I don't know who you sent, but this woman clearly was sent by you. And she handed me back my boy and she leaned over and she said with tears in her eyes, she said, thank you so much for letting me hold your son. She said, I lost my son just a few months ago. And she said, you were an answer to my prayers. I looked at her and tears came back into my eyes and I said, you were an answer to mine. You know, you never know who's around you who God sends, what the assignment is. But I can tell you this, God answered prayers. He didn't just answer mine, but he answered hers too. Wow, that is powerful. So I, I just want to encourage you with these words. Like a farmer who puts something in the ground and they can't see what's happening, trust, believe, uh, be patient. Incredible things are happening, even though you're not aware. I know some of you feel like you're at the end of your rope. I know some of you feel like, I just can't go on. Uh, you feel like God's abandoned you or betrayed you or forgotten all about you. Like a farmer, just hang on, just be patient. God's doing stuff, and one day it's going to all make sense, and you're going to go, okay, I got, I got it. But right now, you got a choice. You can have God or you can have impatience. But you can't have God and impatience. Patience destroys your trust in God. Trust God. Let's pray. So, Father, we do ask that you would cause us to get this. This is so practical because we're going to get impatient leaving the parking lot here. And, God, we've got to just slow down and quit being in such a hurry. Our life's going to be over before we know it. It's missed, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's going to be gone so fast. We should probably slow down and just enjoy every single day, every single person, every single moment. It's a gift, and we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We got today. We got right now. Slow us down, Father, and help us to see you for who you are. Oh, we know, we know we're not going to get it. We're not going to see what's going on underground. But something's going to happen here. A little sprout's going to bust forth, and, and then slowly it's going to become something that is so different than what it is right now. So will our lives. Help us to look for a country that's not this one. Something better that you've prepared for us. In time, it'll come. Amen. Thank you, guys.